Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting one on the Book of Romans entitled Salvation by Faith Alone, the Book of Romans. And this is lesson number 11 in that series entitled The Elect. It's for December 16 of 2017, and I hope you have your Bible handy. We're going to be focusing on the chapters 10 and 11 in the book of Romans. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as usual, we recognize your presence with us and guidance as we open these uh, particular chapters and looking at some other things that relate to them. What can we f discover here about Paul's attitude toward his fellow countrymen, the Jews in particular, and how that might impact us in our attempts to spread the gospel. May we learn what we need to know is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We've already noticed that in Romans 1 to 8, Paul spelled out as clearly as he could his understanding of salvation and the gospel. And then in Romans 9, 10, and 11, he turns to his <coughs> Jewish uh, fellow na people, nationalists, and he says, I know some of you aren't really happy with what I've said. Let me make it very clear that I would love to save every Jew, just as God would. So he talks about the history of the Jews and the implications that has for Gentiles, and we'll see how that works out as we move along. He went on to describe how the fu in the future the Gentiles might in turn be able to help the Jews. And just to make things clear, squabbling between Jews and Christians has a long history. There are many parts of this story that Christians seem to know little about. In the early centuries of the Christian era, the fight was over the Greek Old Testament known as the Septuagint or in Latin LXX. That's the official uh, Greek version that the uh, was used back in Jesus' day. The Jews regarded the Old Testament as their national history. They said, this is ours, we have the right to decide how, to say how it should be interpreted, etc. Of course, in those days, very few Jews actually spoke or read Hebrew. So they wanted to, they wanted to commandeer the Greek translation of the Old Testament. But the Christians regarded the Old Testament, the Greek translation, as the first half of the salvation story, which was to be matched by the New Testament and fulfilled by it. A war of words took place over a couple hundred years regarding this issue. As it turned out, the number of Jews, or at least organized groups of Jews, diminished pretty rapidly after the destruction of Jerusalem, and the number of Christians exploded until Christianity became the official religion of the uh, Roman Empire. So, the Jews finally just gave up and said, okay, take your Old Testament Greek, see if we care. We'll go back and we'll, we'll go to our Hebrew. And of course, there were very, essentially no Christian Hebrew scholars to fight with them. And so uh, we had a, a, dis, a, a difference of opinion. And there are significant differences between the Septuagint translation and uh, the Hebrew. Another area of conflict, of course, was over the Sabbath. Uh, in the early days of Christ and Christianity, Christians and Jews all jointly worshipped on the seven-day Sabbath. But after the wars with the Jews culminating in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and the final conquest of Masada in AD 74, Christians began to try to distance themselves from the Jews. In the early years of the fourth century, this is quite a while later, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Over the next 100, 200 years, the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday because Sunday was the venerable day of the sun, which came to be celebrated as a day of Christ's resurrection. Of course, the Jews remained faithful to the observance of the seventh-day Sabbath. Unfortunately, the animosity between Christians and Jews persisted through the Protestant Reformation and was at least partially the impetus for the Holocaust during World War II, I'm sorry to say. So, with that little bit of history, turning now to Romans 9 through 11, we've already seen that Paul turned his attention to his fellow countrymen, the Jews. In Romans 9, we notice that he said, look back, it's very clear that 
right through the Old Testament, God intended for the gospel to go to everyone. The Jews were supposed to witness to everyone. They weren't, it wasn't supposed to be exclusive. In fact, he said many of the descendants of Abraham were not included in those promises, but they should have been evangelized by the specific descendants of Isaac and Jacob. Well, in that time, he predicted in, in chapters 20, 10 and 11, he showed the spiritual ups and downs of the Jews and how, they have re how that had resulted, resulted in the gospel going to the Gentiles. He predicted that eventually those Gentiles would turn and once again spread the gospel to the Jews. In this discussion, Paul's overall theme was that God's calling or election is open to all, Jew and Gentile, free and slave, male and female, and you remember the famous verse in Galatians 3.28. So, these two chapters, Romans 10 and 11, our Bible study guide says, have been and remain the focal point of much discussion. One point, however, comes clearly through them all, and that is God's love for humanity and His great desire to see all humanity saved. There is no corporate rejection of anyone for salvation. What would we mean if we said corporate rejection? Everybody. We, what? I say everybody. It means all nations, everybody. Well, corporate means a, speci a whole group, not an individual, but a whole group. So Paul is saying the Jews haven't been rejected, Gentiles haven't been rejected, the Romans haven't been rejected, nobody's, God wants to save everybody. So this grace comes to all through Jesus Christ, not by nationality, not by birth, not by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus who died as a substitute for sinners everywhere. Roles may change, but the basic plan of salvation never does. So how did Paul feel about his fellow countrymen? Well, just look at these initial passages for each of those three chapters. Romans 9, 1 to 3, first of all. I'm speaking the truth. I belong to Christ and I do not lie. My conscience, ruled by the Holy Spirit, also assures me that I am not lying when I say how great is my sorrow, my endless pain in my heart for my people, my own flesh and blood. For their sake, I could wish that I myself were under God's curse and separated from Christ. And then turning over to the first two verses of chapter 10, my brothers and sisters, how I wish with all my heart that my own people might be saved. How I pray to God for them. I can assure you that they are deeply devoted to God, but their devotion is not based on true knowledge. And then finally, chapter 11, I ask then, did God reject his own people? Certainly not. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Well, you've heard me read for long enough. Do you get the clear picture that Paul believes that the Jews are going to be saved, or some of them anyway? Well, he, was, he felt he was saved, and he was mm -hmm. a Jew, so. Do you remember what we read in Romans 1 and 2? Remember, Romans 1 talks about the terrible sins of the pagans and so forth like this, and then Romans 2 says what? The Jews are just as... You uh, Jews are worse. You, criti you critical Jews are worse than the pagans. And you might think, after having said that, that um, he was just dismissing the Jews completely. But in these chapters, he makes it clear that the gospel is still wide open to believing Jews. He was one, and he himself had a great burden for them, even though many of their leaders were seeking his life. Now... Let's be honest, was it only the leaders of the Jewish nation that were after Paul, or were some of the Christian Jewish leaders after Paul? Not necessarily to kill him, but... Well, the Judaizers that he had disputes with. Yep. So, now let's get down to some real practical questions. What mistakes did the Jews make? Stumbled over the stumbling stone. <laughs> the stumbling stone. There's another name for that. What would it be? Well, the Messiah. They, the Messiah. They were they looking were for a different kind of Messiah. They were looking for a different kind of Messiah. How did they get that idea? From the Old Testament. They read the... Pro the there's a few prophecies in the Old Testament 
that we now understand apply to the third to the second coming and possibly even there's one or two that apply to the third coming and they wanted those those prophecies to apply to his first coming they wanted him to come in the clouds of glory with all the angels with him and just wipe out their enemies do we feel a little bit like that in our day are we trying to wipe out our enemies <laughs> i'm just asking <coughs> that's what i was asking <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, in many ways, we're like those Jews. Could we make some of the same mistakes? Don't everybody talk at once. <laughs> There's no temptation that, that is not common to man. Okay. So we, we need to be careful lest we fall. Well, th the Jews had this detailed blueprint of exactly what should be done, deeds to be done, and sins to be shunned. Do we have one of those? Absolutely. We do? <laughs> well, how many of the details of their blueprint do we still believe and try to follow? How many fundamentals do we have now? <laughs> Well, we, like, we like to f define things because it makes them easier to grasp, but they, then they become more finite. So, and they were pretty good at that, weren't they? Yeah. Right. <laughs> they had more than 28, didn't they have? Uh, well, they had, what, 516 just for the Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ellen White had some comments about that kind of stuff. Here in a, a manuscript she wrote in 1883, it's a re re preserved in volume one of Selected Messages, page 69. She wrote, for 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. What's she talking about there? Wandering in the wilderness. Wandering in the wilderness. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. Are we wandering in the wilderness? She's talking about us. Do we ever think of ourselves as modern Israel? In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration and strife among God's professed people, would that be us? That have kept us in this world, us kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. But she wrote that 135 years ago. Yeah. So that was about our grandfathers and great-grandfathers. Couldn't be about us. No. So since we're very much on the ball and we have everything straight, uh, we can hardly wait for the Lord to come and take us, right? We're just waiting for the good Lord to arrive. Well, Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 Starting verse 6, he says, Now these things happen as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. Yeah, and what about he's that? he's talking about any, anyone who'd, who'd read this, I, I think, and then it's, he lists several things, and then he gets down to the one I was trying to quote, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you'll be able to endure it in verse 13. So yeah. um, that's good news, but there is the warning that leads up to that good news. Yeah. Well, 18 years later, Alan White wrote these words, we may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination, many more years. What would be included under insubordination? As did the children of Israel, but for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. Now that Evangel was written after 1888 General Conference, wasn't that it? That was written in 1901. So 13 years after that. Mm -hmm. Was that insubordination in 1888? Well, it sure could sound like it sometimes, huh? Well, here's another one. I don't know how many quotes we need to see. The man who attempts... Now, here we, here we are. Think about people and why they do what they do in our world today. Let's, let's think... Do I dare say, let us talk about Seventh-day Adventists? Well, the man who attempts to keep the commandments of God 
Now, Adventists supposedly proclaim to keep the commandments of God, right? From a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so, will never enter into the joy of, disobe of obedience. And it is worse than that, he does not obey. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. Wow. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. Christ's Object Lessons 97, the bottom and up to the top of 98. Do you feel required to keep the Ten Commandments? Yes. Well, aren't you just going against what you said? Well, you feel required, those who feel required to keep the commandments. I, I want to keep the Ten Commandments. I don't want to kill anybody. But do you feel required? Well, I mean, if the only reason you're doing it is because you feel required, then you... you, you uh, so you can feel required as long as you want to do it. Uh, Might have mixed emotions. Yeah. And we it, bear a lot of baggage, you know, where we grew up with those sorts of things. So you may have those feelings, whether you act in that way is another matter. Sorry. Well, it, if you have a, a sense that uh, God has given us instruction, we as rebellious tend to rebel on things, but we know that it's the right thing to do. Are we required to do that? You're free, well, free, to, free to reject it. Do you yeah. feel required to do it? Depends if, upon your definition of feel required. Yeah. yeah, it just seems pretty clear to me. Do you feel required to, to keep the Ten Commandments? Do I feel required to hold my daughter, my granddaughter's hand when I go across the street? Do you? No. I do it because I know that I don't want any car coming because, inadvertently. Because you feel like you're required to hold on to the hand. Because it's for the safety and well-being of that I, granddaughter. When I was walking across the street with her today, I didn't think, I'm required to hold her hand because if her mother was here, she'd want it. I, that thought never crossed my mind. It wasn't solid I, submission which produces a character of a rebel. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. It was because I knew it was the right thing to do. Yeah. But do you feel required? No. But okay. Not at all. What we call the Ten Commandments, I like to call it the Ten Prescription, or the, a prescription of how things are, def are how things really will work so out you properly. You have to feel required. No, you it, you you have a choice, yeah, and, and you it's said the choice. A prescription, so you must it's a feel as required. It's not a proscription; no. it's a prescription, like a, a yeah. medical okay. prescription. Yeah. I can choose to fulfill it, fulfill, or excuse me, fill the. Prescription, or just leave it on my deck at home. But you still feel required. No. Required for what? No, I'm, I'm, I don't. Keep the commandments. For, in order to. Oh. Yeah. But if, if, if you're, requ no. you're required in the same sense that you're required to go to heaven if you want to be saved. You don't have to. No, no, Yes, no. exactly. You, she said specifically, those who feel required. Mm -hmm. So those do you feel do required? Be. I feel required to do certain things. You, you have to, there's certain things that you have to do to prepare yourself to live in the kingdom of heaven. And keeping the commandments is one of them. You're required. Yes. So back. keeping the, require, the commandments, you're required. Let's go back to what she, she yeah. said, said. From a sense of obligation, obligation merely, merely, because he is required to, to do so. Yeah. That's the context of the required. So merely. Merely, merely because you're that, obligated. That, so That's you the can, only reason. You can still feel re required, but as long as you want to do it, it's yeah. okay. I used to like what uh, Richard Nice says. I would do things in such this way, even if there was no pie in the sky. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it makes a whole lot. Of I sense. don't know what they mean by that. I, I actually don't feel that way myself. I do it because it's the truth. I mean, if it's not the truth, well, then there's no reason to do it. No okay. argument here on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Romans 10, 1 to 4. Let's go there. My brothers and sisters, how I wish with all my heart that my own people might be saved. How I pray to God for them. I can assure you that they are deeply devoted to God. 
but their devotion is not based on true knowledge. They have not known the way in which God puts people right with himself, and instead they have tried to set up, for the, set up their own way. And so they did not substitute, and so they did not submit themselves to God's way of putting people right. For Christ has brought the law to an end, so that everyone who believes is put right with God. Um, what does all that mean? Well, you're required to believe, that's for sure. <laughs> Notice carefully that the verse before, well, in Romans 10, 3, Paul was talking about the Jews' att attempt to establish their own righteousness. And then in verse 5, he referred to the process of establishing a two -way, true, way of, true way of righteousness. In effect, Paul suggested that the Jews rejected the true Messiah because he did not fit their preconceived ideas about what the Messiah should do and be. J.B. Phillips seems to have captured the two significance of Romans 10, for in these words, he, tra he, he paraphrases, for Christ means the end of the struggle for righteousness by the law for everyone who believes, that is, has faith or trust in him. Righteousness by the law, what does that mean? If you obey in order to obtain salvation. Yeah. I think that's, if you think you're going to obtain salvation because you obey, yeah, then that's believe, righteousness yeah. If you by believe the you're law. earning your way to salvation by keeping the law, yeah. then that's the problem. Well, there was about 1,800 years between the days of Abraham and the coming of Christ. And if we read through the Old Testament the history of the Jews, you might easily understand why the Jews themselves came to think of themselves as God's special people. I mean, aren't there lots of verses that seem to suggest that? Some of them even believed that salvation was guaranteed to them because of their heritage. Could we fall into a trap like that? Do we sometimes suggest that we have the truth? We've talked about that before. Sometimes? about all the time? <laughs> all the time. Uh, last week we suggested it would be better if the truth had us. Well, don't we claim to keep all the Ten Commandments? I listened to a presentation just today by some young Adventists saying, okay, one of the marks of the Seventh Adventist Church is we keep the commandments. Can, he, can we deny that? Well, you look at Revelation here, they that keep, uh, have faith in Jesus and keep the commandments of God, so that's probably where their, yeah. their thoughts are coming from. Sure. Didn't Joan, Jones and Wagner get in trouble with those kinds of people? Because they were coming with this idea of, of faith, righteousness by faith, Yeah. and all of a sudden, well, where does the law fit in then? Yeah. Why then the law? Yes, that was a long discussion that we unfortunately don't have time to discuss right now, but yeah, they did. And unfortunately, they went over overboard the other, too far in the other direction. Well, what about us? Do we, do we think about the things that we don't do? We stay away from certain kinds of impure foods. We try to avoid alcohol and tobacco. Do we ever have this unconscious feeling that uh, we are superior to those who don't follow these restrictions? What about the pastor? Does the pastor have to exude confidence to inspire confidence? Don't we expect that? Well, he could be acting like a fool if he does that. Well, not if he's, he really believes in what he's teaching. Well, when does... Uh, well. Okay. Well, is, uh, is salvation based on all the things we do or don't do? No. We have, this, we have this conundrum that we struggle with all the time. We're saved by faith, but we're judged by our works. If, if saving and salvation is health and heal, mm -hmm. uh, so it's not a, a legal problem, what we need to do is heal uh, the way we think, and the way we think is about God and affects how we conduct our lives. Yeah. So. 
Well, another way to explain Romans 10.4 that we've often used as a church is to point out that when it says Christ is the end of the law, the word end, teleos in Greek, can mean a goal or a purpose, suggesting that, you know, the law, its purpose is to bring us to Christ. That's Galatians 3.19 to 24. So, is, is that a valid explanation of what Paul is trying to say? <coughs> Did the law protect the Jews and lead and do, help them develop a correct faith? No, it did not. Well, some of them. Some, yeah. some of them. David, I mean, they, they were fallible yeah. people, but uh, David and the prophets and Daniel and uh, there were many, there was always somebody, a remnant well, so they kept that God the law? kept. They kept the law? And that's why they're I wasn't being saved. there, so I, is that why they're God being is, saved? God though? has said God told Elijah that he had, he had yeah. preserved seven thousand uh, seven thousand who had not bowed uh, the knee but to what Baal. What does that mean, though? It doesn't mean necessarily connected to the law. Well, it uh, means it well, means that the, these people yeah. were doing enough of what was right, so God felt comfortable in saving them. Maybe it's because they had faith in God; they trusted Him. Not necessarily that they were behaving perfectly. Well, here's the, here's a magic formula, easy formula. Let me just read it to you. Romans 10, 9 through 13. If you confess that Jesus is Lord, now that's not too complicated, right? And believe that God raised him from death, do we believe that? You will be saved. Bang. Do we need any of the rest of the Bible? For it is by our faith that we are put right with God. Don't we believe that? Is It is by our confession that we are saved. The scripture says whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. This includes everyone because there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. God is the same Lord of all and richly blesses all who call to him. As the scripture says, everyone who calls out to the Lord for help will be saved. Now, Amen. Isn't that as simple as you can make it? Well, you're talking about two things here. You're talking about salvation, and you're talking about doing better. Okay. So we're going to be doing better for eternity. Mm -hmm. But as far as being saved, um, those are the that's the correct formula right there. Well, okay. What about Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23 here? Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is Jesus' words. But only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. When judgment day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in, in your name we spoke God's message. By your name we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. And I read that verse, and those verses, and I think in Matthew 10, Jesus gave his disciples the power to convert people, to heal them, and to raise them from the dead. Did Judas have that power? Apparently. Apparently yeah, you'd think so. But you know, the way I look at that, if you're being saved into something, you want to want to be into that something, wouldn't you? So if you don't do the works, if you don't, want to be saved so that you could live a better life going on that um, what's the use of being saved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you don't want to go to heaven, there's no... There's no well, way. if you don't want to live like they do in heaven. Well, but you can still White. be saved when you call when you call your call the Lord's name, but then you go into that place that you're saved and then all of a sudden you don't want to be there. Yeah. I think so that, that doesn't make sense. That term, the one who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, I think it has a, a different meaning. It's, hey, call somebody up. Yeah. That's the way you think. You, you're responding yeah. to, to, to truth. Yeah. And Ellen White says, and I'm sorry I could, would like to call it a bright mouth, but I can't, um, said that it, for Satan to go to heaven would be supreme torture. It would be hell. It would be hell for him. Well, it's going to be to anybody that's lost. I don't think there's no, going to be... We're talking about if a person was forced to go to heaven or somehow ended up in heaven, but he doesn't want to be there, that would be a hell for him. 
Yeah. Yeah, but I don't think there's going to be anybody that will be killed because they don't want to be there. Nobody's going to be killed by God. It's just that sin pays its wage. <laughs> well, yeah. I didn't say by God. I just said by killed. I'm not going to argue on how that happens, but they are going to be killed. The second death is real, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I, but why, why is that a problem? I don't understand why that's a problem. Well, second... I mean, the, the, well, people, the people who don't want to go to heaven, where, what's God going to do with them? Well, somehow they don't have to stay there, right? They don't have because to stay in why heaven? Would, because it would be torture for them to be there. Yeah. They're going to see heaven at the third coming. That's fine. That's fine. But still, if they don't want to be there yeah. and the Lord keeps them there, it's going to be torture the whole time. So if, how, how is it, gonna how's it going to be deal with? Yeah, he, obviously that's not going to happen. Everything God is for freedom and you know, no coercion, extortion, duress on God's well, part. Remember Paul said to that Philippian jailer, believe in the Lord or have faith in the Lord, trust in the Lord, and you will be saved. Isn't that simple enough? And that's to the jailer's question, what must I do to be saved? Mm -hmm. Just believe. Well, and you're saved. If we trust in God, he can heal all the damage done by sin. Well, well, should, should, be, should people be able to tell whether or not we've been saved? How, do we, how does Matthew 5, 16 fit in? In the same way, your light must shine before peop people, excuse me, so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. They're spo supposed to be able to see the things you do and praise your Father in heaven. How does that work? Well, obviously, you're living in such a way that your life shines through. Mm -hmm. there, people are seeing something other than this person here. Mm -hmm. And how many people, and I, sh I shouldn't even ask this question, but I think we need to ask it of ourselves, how many people do you know that have the light of God shining through? How many do you know? Well, I have the same problem you do. Well, we can kind of, um, we can kind of theorize on what that person would be. But yeah. it would be great if we had somebody to point to and say, see, there you go, right there. It's just the ones that the young girl saw in the stained glass window that the light was shining through, yeah. the saints. Yeah, the little girl that said, who's a saint? He, they're the ones that the light shines through. Well, as the scripture says, and, and look at their passage, Romans 10, that's what we're working on. I'm down to verse 13, as the scripture says, Everyone who calls out to the Lord for help will be saved. We've mentioned that just briefly. But look at, this is his, his next comment. Where do we fit in this? But how can they call to him for help if they have not believed? And how can they believe if they have not heard the message? And how can they hear if the message is not proclaimed? And how can the message be proclaimed if the messengers are not sent out? Oh dear, this is starting to get personal. As the scripture says, how wonderful is the coming of messengers who bring good news. But not all have accepted the good news. Isaiah himself said, Lord, who believed our message? So then faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through preaching Christ. Faith comes from hearing the message, the message comes through preaching Christ. Why do you think, um, why, did, why, didn't, why didn't Paul say um, faith comes by Bible study? There weren't enough weren't very many of them around. Why? They, they couldn't read them. They, they were expensive. There were very few of them. They were handwritten. They had to be hand copied on, on material that was very expensive. And very few of them had the ability to read. So how did, they, how did they learn about God? By hearing. How did they hear? By what they would read. someone being able In to read or In the church service, somebody would stand up, either having memorized the passage or having the scroll open, and he would read to them, and I mean, we don't. I, I wish we had a movie of, a made a video of, of exactly how those services took place, and I'm sure it was different in different places. But they were in private houses. Remember, it was it was against the law to be a Christian when these all these things happened that we're talking about here. It was against the law, and if you were caught, 
I mean, sometimes they were more zealous in trying to get rid of Christians than other times, but if you were caught, you could be in prison, and obviously there were times when, I mean, Paul was executed, Peter was executed. We, our best guess is that every one of the disciples were, were mar ended up being martyrs except John. So, And they tried to kill him. Mm -hmm. Well, so how would we do today? if the only chance we had to hear Bible was you go to church and someone reads a portion of it? Would we go to church more often? Maybe. Would we go every day? Well, the question I have is, if our minds are, are so full of sound bites, do we remember what the pastor says on Sabbath? Well, doesn't he give the Bible and sound bites anyway? I haven't heard him sit up there and just read the Bible chapter after chapter. Well, I mean, I'm not saying that's the way it needs to be done, but what about that? Ellen White says we would do well to occasionally on a Sabbath to have someone stand up and not read nicely a portion of Scripture. Well, and then she also says you should read a, a verse and meditate on it. Yeah. Did, and the group she, you did she say for the day or what did she say? In a, a group, you discuss things mm -hmm. and bring life experiences to it yeah. and, and compare it with other texts and so forth. So some learning going on. Well, this verse in Romans ten seventeen is a very imp one of the few verses that just sort of specifically says, what's the source of faith? So what, what is the source of faith? Hearing. Hearing the message. Basically scriptures, isn't it? It's the scriptures. And anything which is not based on faith is... Now we're jumping sin. forward a couple of chapters, Romans 14, 20. Anything which is not based on faith is sin. So if you read the scriptures, you're guaranteed to get faith? Depends on how you respond. Well, you just said all you have to do is read it. I'm quoting scriptures. Quoting the scriptures. Well, I... It's not guaranteeing yeah. that it comes, but it's, yeah. it's there if you if you're receptive to it. So if it does come, it comes from the scripture. Yeah. Right. It, right. it is the attitude with which one reads and mm -hmm. or in our day studies. Mm -hmm. And it will bring you to a time of decision. You'll either be in favor of it or reject it. Mm -hmm. Come now, let us reason together. Some people are going to reject. Yeah. One may reject, 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 and then see the light. and. Or the other way. Or maybe they'll hear the message from another person, which is basically the same message, but the personality wasn't up in impediment. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So if the scriptures are our main source of information, our main source of, of developing faith, then we should develop a faith relationship by studying and understanding those scriptures, right? So would, that, would it be fair to say from, from those points that faith is based on evidence? Evidence which comes from Scripture? What did Paul... Specifically ha is faith. Well, I believe from studying Scripture and for having friends who worked on this that faith is a, is a relationship with God. And it means God is your friend. Faith is a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Trusting relationship. Mm -hmm. I found but it. But how do you get that? Experience. From, from well, ex personal experience experience. experience and through specifically, especially through understanding God through the scriptures. So you're saying that faith comes through reading the scripture and a lot of time. Because it takes a while to understand, to get to know somebody. Yeah. But that, that might be kind of bad if, you don't have very much time. Well, think about... The thief on the cross didn't have much time. No. Well, that's Fli true. Do you think that he knew God The Philippian well? jailer well? had a very short amount of time, too. It's mm -hmm. not Okay, so, much. It's so where does the faith come in there that's a relationship when you haven't even had enough time to develop one? God appeals to or uses logic to communicate. Words, which are symbols of ideas, Logos, you could say, and that's where you get logic from. That's mm -hmm. one way to look at it. And God, the truth, is communicated to a person that can ultimately be persuaded for or against their, their position. Maybe they expand their understanding. Well, the, the thief on the cross, though, expressed faith. You know, remember me when you come in, 
into your kingdom. If, if you look at Desire of Ages and some of the other places where she talks about that situation, she says that this thief had earlier followed Jesus for a while. And he thought, and he was very attracted to Jesus, but then he thought, it just couldn't be possible that all our Jewish leaders are wrong about him. So he turned away from Jesus, fell into crime and bad associates, and ended up being crucified beside Jesus. And then he realized, you know, I was wrong, but now I understand. So that, he came back. So it wasn't a instantaneous two-hour in encounter. No. Well, but what I, about the jailer then? But I think there's instances that when That started you, as a two-hour or less encounter. If you spend two hours in a room with a group of people you don't know, there are certain people in that room that you're going to go, I'd like to talk to them further. And there's others where you go, I have no need to talk to this person again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, you, you've gained at least an idea of a personality of someone that you would like to get to know better. Well, that's good, but um, Ken said that faith is just a relationship with God. How do you, how do you get well, that relationship if you don't have enough time to, to well, let, let, build let's, it? Let's look at our, uh, our Philippian jailer for a moment. Here were two men jailed because they supposedly had done some terrible things. They're singing in the middle of the jail, deep into the jail. Somehow connected to them, there's suddenly an incredible earthquake. All the jail doors are open, and they say, and he comes rushing in because he's about to kill himself. He says because he knows what will happen to him if his, all his prisoners get loose. And these guys say, "No, everybody's here. Don't worry. We're." I mean, you would have to say something strange is going on here. Something really <laughs> strange is going on. I've heard the the songs they were singing yep. too, which would have been scripture songs, songs of faith, and and uh, you know who knows what what yep. they were saying. And that was the start of the relationship yeah. of the Philippian jailer and his family with, with God. I see the start as being attracted to might and power because the power of the earthquake broke everything apart. So maybe he was scared and um, what kind of relationship is I have that? a different way of viewing it. Well, it's possible. Well, let's I, I agree that that, that does that, that, but I will tell you the experience that I heard today was my coworker who was in a very high stress situation had just met someone that he had spent an hour with and this traumatic event happened and they are now bonded by friendship of a common experience. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Do you want to say specifically that this was a multiple shooting event? Yeah, he's going to have... Well, let's, let's, let's ask ourselves a question. I'm going to ask two or three questions here. We have speculated what we think it means. What do you think when Paul said, preaching Christ, what did he mean? Well, it, let me just give a clue. If you look at the sermons that are recorded in the New Testament, the sermons in the New Testament, they followed a f almost every one of them, follows a pretty specific pattern, uh, particularly those that were addressed primarily to Jews. It says, look at the prophecies in the Old Testament. Look at the life of Jesus. See how his life is a fulfillment of those prophecies in the Old Testament. What difference does that make to you? What should you do about it? Pretty, pretty straightforward argument. Well, some of us have come to the conclusion that it's possible that that sequence, that sequence of ideas might have started with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, there in Luke 24. I don't want to take time to read all that right now, but remember those, Jesus walked with those two people and they came back and they had that message just ringing in their ears. He said, didn't our hearts burn within us? And Jesus did not tell them, I am Jesus and here is no. what you should believe. He led no. them through the scriptures and they believed and then finally he said, I am Jesus. Yeah. Well, moving on, Romans 10, 18 to 21. But I ask, is it true that they did not hear the message? Of course they did, for as the scripture says, 
the sound of their voice went out to all the world. Their words are reaching, have, words reached the ends of the earth. Again, I asked, did the people of Israel not want, not uh, understand? Moses himself is the first to answer. I will use a so-called nation to make my people jealous. And by means of a nation of fools, I will make my people angry. And Isaiah is even bolder when he says, I was found by those who were not looking for me. I appeared to those who were not asking for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I held out my hands to welcome a disobedient and rebellious people. So what's Paul trying to say in those verses? You aren't saved or lost as a nation. That's right. And well, they had the opportunity to respond. And he's trying to say, what I'm now trying to do, what I'm trying to get you to help me to do, it was God's plan since the days of Moses, right? So he quotes three passages from Old, the Old Testament, Psalm 19.4, 19, Deuteronomy 32.21, and Isaiah 65, 1 and 2. Those are the passages I quoted. Um, well, how much of the gospel can you learn from nature? Well, earlier in the book, he says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through that which was, has been made, so that they were without excuse. Yep. Um, now, of course, Jesus was a much clear revelation of, of the character of God, but they're, they're yeah. without excuse, Paul says earlier in chapter 1. I mean, and he talks about the beautiful lilies, and he talks about, I mean, there's a lot of gorgeous things and wonderful things that happen in nature that tell us about God's love. And there are uh, things that aren't lovely. Anymore. Yeah, there's a lot of things that aren't so lovely. It's mostly in the animal kingdom. Yeah. Well, Paul wanted to make it very clear that although many of the Jews rejected Jesus Christ when he came as a Messiah, that was not true of all Jews. Virtually all of the early converts to Christianity were Jews. While essentially all the Jewish leaders rejected Christ, at least initially, we have exceptions in, can you name some? Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, Paul himself, Barnabas, Simon the Pharisee and former leper. I mean, these people were Pharisees. They tell us that many of the Pharisees actually became, Acts 15, 5, look at this interesting verse. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. Now, they wanted to bring some of their Pharisaical ideas into the Christian church, but our point for right now is there were a significant number of Pharisees who became Christians. And if you go over to uh, Acts 6, verse 7, it says that Sad the priests became Christians, a number of them. Okay, moving into chapter 11, since we're running out of time. Um, what then? The people of Israel did not find that they were, what they were looking for. It was only the small group that God chose who found it. The rest grew deaf to, all, to God's call. As the scripture says, God made their minds and hearts dull. To this very day they cannot see or hear. And David says, may they be caught and trapped at their feasts. May they fall. May they be punished. May their eyes be blinded so that they cannot see and make them bend up under their troubles at all times. Wow. Is David talking about Jews there? Well, the interesting thing is in that, that chapter, Psalm 69, there are several, pa several parts of that chapter we quote as Messianic prophecies. And it's interesting, I just read you the, the, the comment about blinded, the Jews being blinded. The word actually is por poros porosis in Greek, which more correctly should be hardened. Do you know anybody else in the Bible who was hardened? Pharaoh. Well, Pharaoh says his heart was hardened, God hardened his heart, Heart was hard. His heart was, yeah. Many Christians have had very negative attitudes toward the Jews because of what happened to Jesus Christ. While those who were responsible were leaders of the Jewish nation at the time, they were only a relative handful compared to the whole of the Jewish population. Unfortunately, as we noted earlier, those attitudes per persisted in anti-Semitism and resulted ultimately in the Holocaust. 
Is it possible that the attitudes of Christians have been at least partially responsible for the rejection of Christianity by many Jews? Um, I had the privilege, if you want to call it that, of traveling in Eastern Europe just recently. We visited Auschwitz in Poland. We visited the Ninth Fort in Lithuania and other places where just terrible, terrible, terrible examples of mass murders and persecutions and so forth came out, it came as a result of anti-Semitism. And unfortunately, even some of our Protestant reformers, Martin Luther specifically is quoted as saying that uh, these Jews, uh, Jim, you, you've run across that passage, you know what it said? Yeah, it's in a book called Tischreden, it's uh, part of Luther's works. Uh, Table Talks number 1795 really hardly ever been translated into English, but it goes something like this. If I were to baptize a Jew, I would take him up onto the bridge over the river Elbe, tie a millstone around his neck and tell him he was baptized in the name of his oh, father man. Abraham. And uh, when I first heard that, it was like being hit in the solar plexus. I thought, man, this is terrible. But I finally found it at a Claremont School of Theology the first time, and it, lo and behold, it's in there, but uh, St. Martin Luther had his warts and pimples too, so. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and to speak a word for him, he thought, he, he was so excited himself about the idea of salvation by faith alone, he thought if he could just, he should be able to tell everybody they would just all become converted. And he, and he thought, man, the Jews, they have the Bible, they have it in their own language. There are, books, there are books about Martin Luther psychoanalyzing him yeah. uh, because they couldn't understand how earlier on he had a great relationship with Jews and, mm -hmm. and possibly helped him in his translation, but then it couldn't, he, out of frustration apparently, he just couldn't get anybody, yeah. get a significant number to uh, subscribe to his way of thinking. And well, what was their early Jews, what was their relationship with Christianity? Well, about. we know about from Acts 7, the stoning of Stephen, and then Acts 8, verse 1, they, they turned to an all-out persecution of, of, of Christians, and of course Paul was one of the leading people involved in that. Well, in Romans 11, 16 to 24, we read about um, some of the system, symbols in the passage. Uh, the tree was cultivated. It was cultivated and must represent the Jewish nation. Remember, he talks about Okay, here's a tree. You take the natural branches and you cut them off because they're not, you're not bearing any fruit. And you, you graft in a branch from a wild olive. And then he says, remember that you're not supporting the tree. The tree is supporting you. And you can be taken off just as easily as the, the natural branches were taken off. And furthermore, those natural branches could be grafted back in. He's stretching the, the facts here a little bit, but that's, that's okay. He was making his point. Um, what about that? What can we learn from that? Do we, do we ever get to have a feeling of entitlement like the Jews did? Some people today think they're entitled to heaven. Well, one thing is very clear. He did not hold the idea once saved, always saved. No, he didn't. And branches can be torn out and then put back. That's not once saved, always saved. The only basis for salvation is a continuing relationship with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and through continued Bible study and prayer to become more like Jesus. At all costs, we need to avoid the entitlement attitude that the Jews had. That entitlement attitude permeated the Roman Catholic Church and now is permeating modern Protestantism. Could it have inf infect us as well? Instead of feeling entitled, we just need to be very thankful for what God has done for us. And then finally, Christian scholars have puzzled over verses 25 to 27. What does it mean, the, the fullness of the Gentiles, and when will the gospel start coming back to the Jews? Well, Ellen White said these words, in the closing proclamation of the gospel, when special work is to be done for classes of people hitherto neglected, God expects his messengers to take particular interest in the Jewish people whom they find in all parts of the earth. As the Old Testament scriptures are blended with the new in an ex explanation of Jehovah's eternal purpose, this will be to many of the Jews as the dawn of a new creation, the resurrection of the soul. As they see the Christ of the gospel 
dispensation portrayed in the pages of the Old Testament scriptures and perceive how clearly the New Testament explains the Old, their slumbering faculties will be aroused and they will recognize Christ as the Savior of the world. Many will by faith receive Christ as their Redeemer. To them will be fulfilled the words, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1, 12. Ellen White, the Acts of the Apostles 381. In another place she says, There is a mighty work to be done in our world. The Lord has declared that the Gentiles shall be gathered in, and not the Gentiles only, but the Jews. There are among the Jews many who will be converted and through whom we shall see the salvation of God go forth as a lamp that burneth. There are Jews everywhere, and to them the light of present truth is to be brought. There are among many, among them many who will come to the light and who will proclaim the immutability of the law of God with wonderful power. Evangelism 578. I wonder uh, how many people even around this table have Jewish blood in them. Good question. Well, consider how Paul must have felt to recognize that some of his worst enemies, those who followed him around and tried to undo the gospel that he had preached, were his own countrymen. How would you feel about that? Paul rejoiced in the fact that God's mercy is open to everyone. The stumble of the Jews had led to the gospel going to the Gentiles and God's mercy being shown to them. And in the future, true Christians will turn once again to evangelize Jews and that will lead to the acceptance of many of them into the Christian fellowship. And finally, she says, among the Jews are some who, like Saul of Tarsus, are mighty in the scriptures, and these will proclaim with wonderful power the immutability of the law of God. The God of Israel will bring this to pass in our day. His arm is not shortened that it cannot save, and his servants will labor in faith as his servants labor in faith for those who have long been neglected and despised. His salvation will be revealed. Well, do we who talk about our Christianity, Seventh-day Adventists, we're probably closest to the Jews of any Christian group. Are we reaching out to the Jews? How good are we doing at that? Do we understand our Old Testament well enough so that we could speak to a Jew who was steeped in the Old Testament? Are we doing our best to reach out to all races, genders, beliefs, or do we just have a comfortable club that we attend on a weekly basis? And isn't that nice? Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the gift that has been given us through your Holy Spirit and through the Jews, our predecessors. And now, Lord, we understand that there's many of them who are probably seeking something more, something better than what they have. Help us and others like us who have a correct understanding or a better understanding of Christianity to reach out to such people in ways that will be meaningful to them as our prayer in Jesus Christ. Amen.